Stephen, welcome to the Rogue One Podcast. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure. I'm really excited. A little bit across the pond. Yeah, no, and you know what? This is going to be, I think, a valuable contribution for steering people in how they spend a good chunk of their time training. Because when I started with cycling on my quest to get a little bit faster, I was in university and I'm kind of dating myself here, but we had very limited access to the internet. We had like a computer room, but these computers were like slow. There wasn't access to like websites like PubMed and stuff like this. So it was very much high performance happened in the shadows back then and sessions were kind of passed on from one elite rider to the next and if you're outside this little circle it was very difficult to get access to it and now in the last 15 years we have this proliferation of information and in law we call it battle of the forms in disclosure like if you ask for disclosure someone will send you 20 million boxes of stuff and the few nuggets are buried in that 20 million boxes of stuff to the point that you can never find that stuff so that's where we're at, I think, now, where we have channels that are doing great stuff and well-intentioned like GCN, but there's so much information there that it becomes very difficult to sift through it. So the modest task I'm going to set us today is to give an actionable roadmap for athletes for their training. How's that sound? Well, that should be simple enough. <laughs> <laughs> I've only, I've only spent about 30 years working on this topic. So, yeah, no, but I think we do. We've made a lot of progress. Uh, I mean, I'm much older than you, so I can definitely remember way before there was such a thing as an internet. Internet came along when I was uh, finishing up my PhD back in 1993 or so. And uh, so that's 30 years ago. And that entire time, uh, that's been kind of, influenced my career is just the increase in, in network and, and connections. And, and, um, I think it's had a huge impact on human performance because, you know, we're seeing athletes performing at a very high level younger than maybe we would have expected from 20 years ago. Maybe when you were starting out, there was more of an apprentice master relationship yeah. where you were, if you were lucky, you got onto a team and you were allowed to share their secrets. But now there's really not that many secrets, you know. <laughs> so uh, it's an interesting, you know, development that I think does has had an impact on human on endurance performance in cycling. And it's a chat for a different day, but even just to flag it, I think it is interesting that we've gone down this alley of maximizing human physiology. And as you rightly identified, we've so many young athletes coming through. I think the next wave of performance is going to be this realization that the outcome goal in bike races is winning bike races, not putting huge numbers out, not being physiologically the best rider, being physiologically a good rider, but being tactically a great rider. And that's why we're fascinated with cycling and sport because it's not always the fastest guy wins. Otherwise, we just jump up on what bikes and we'd see who can put out the most watts. And cycling more than any other sport, like I used to play soccer and you'd spend hours watching tape of your performances. We still don't do that in cycling. We still don't look at how people are using that physiological engine across the course of a race. Some teams are starting to do it, but it's it's not that prominent. Yeah, well, I can say we, we are doing it. And uh, <laughs> uh, it's just not, it's not ready for prime time, but I, I'm working, I've worked with several teams and, and, I have a wonderful colleague that I met via social media, via Twitter, and he lives over in the UK. And, and we've developed our own analytics program with the help of coaches and athletes. And we're trying to get at some of the things exactly that you're talking about. For example, you know, in a, in a major classic race, there will be maybe a hundred different 90 degree turns in the race. And these turns have, you know, they're not really something we talk about a lot as being features, but they are critical often because if you're not positioned correctly, you burn off a lot of extra energy trying to reaccelerate, to reposition yourself. You what you lose bike links in the in the process of, of negotiating the turn. And we we've developed analytical methods where we can actually identify every turn in a race of a certain. Brilliant to watch. Yeah, and, and now, but it's a teaching tool. The, the coach that I worked with that wanted to develop this, 
He said, look, if I can show them what they're doing wrong, then they can train it. And that's, but so we're starting to move beyond just the, the watts and move into what is the outcome? Because ultimately, when you make bad decisions, positioning, for example, it costs you watts. It costs you energy to try to make up for the mistake. And when you keep doing that too many times, then you don't have the energy you need to, to achieve the speed you need at the end of the race. Because there is statistically so speed, a best lead-out rider in the world. We just, maybe you know who it is, but I don't. But I could go to the pub with my friends and we can all argue and say, oh, is it Danny Van Poppel a better lead-out rider than, Mikhail, than Morkov? The honest answer is we don't know. We're just basing this off small snippets of footage we've seen in the final of races. But statistically, you could definitely work out who the best lead out rider is in the world. And then that gets tagged to wages, transfer values. Well, I, I'm going to make a vote for Von der Poel. Uh, possibly. He's probably one of the best lead outs in possibly ever. But unfortunately for the sprinters behind him, he can also do some other stuff really <laughs> well. But But occasionally when he has chosen to be the lead out, Man, he's good at it. I want to dive deep into the physiology of optimizing a training week. So at the ver very beginning of this chat, a term we're going to use probably over and over again is polarized. Can we ground some terms at the beginning? And what do we mean when we refer to polarized training? What a catch. Roadman, you know how serious I take my goal setting. And I know how serious you take it too. So whether you're chasing fitness or lifestyle goals, and you're looking for a powerful ally to support you on this journey, look no further than Huel. Huel has become my secret weapon for when I don't have time to prepare a balanced meal. It means I get the nutrition I need without sacrificing time or taste. Plus, it stops me from reaching for the takeaway menu. I always throw a bottle of this banana into my backpack when I'm heading into the city, and it stops me eating junk convenience foods that don't support my training goals. It's handy, it's nutritious, it's 22 grams of protein. It's perfect for athletes that don't have time to cook or prepare food before a training session. It's convenient, nutritious fuel at your fingertips, ensuring you hit your daily fueling needs. Huel Ready to Drink has over 26 essential vitamins and minerals in every bottle, making sure you get 175 health benefits. Plus it's made from amazing natural ingredients like sunflower seed, coconut, and more. And the best part, eight mouth-watering flavors. My favorite's the banana. That's what's in my backpack at the moment. You can get Huel direct to your home by going to huel.com forward slash roadman. That's huel, H-U-E-L dot com forward slash roadman. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of guilty of introducing that term to the, to the entire scientific literature, or at least placing it in that context way back in 20, like 2004, so 20 years ago. And I've been trying to figure it out ever since. Um, the, but back then, the initial data that we collected, it was from rowers, it was from uh, cyclists and runners, or uh, no, excuse me, rowers, cross-country skiers uh, and runners. And we saw this in the data that they were either running or rowing very easily at, at you know, low powers, low paces, just aerobic endurance, or they were doing fairly high intensity, often interval-based work. This is what the rowers were doing. They weren't doing threshold workouts. Cross-country skiers, they were doing very disciplined uh, kind of polarization of their training. And so that's the term that, that was used. But if you take that term to, you know, if you say, well, well, the ultimate polarization would be to just basically be sitting on the couch or <laughs> throwing up you know, then, then the term can be misunderstood and misused. And, and there has been a lot of discussion around that. But now I would say 20 years on, what I think athletes have learned how to do with their coaches over decades is they're polarizing their, the stress of the training. So they are doing a lot of their training, I would say, under the stress radar at fairly low intensities for them, but they're using duration. They're saying, hey, I, I will do four hours at a low intensity to build mitochondria because that doesn't create a big stress response in my body as opposed to doing intervals every day. And so uh, 
that seems to be the prevailing, the key feature of polarized training is about 80% of the training is in that proverbial green zone. You know, the athletes are, are talking to each other, they're doing the work, and, and, and maybe they'll have a coffee in the middle of a six-hour ride, but then some of the days are really tough, you know, and so they're doing both, but they're balancing it in a way that is sustainable. So polarized training to me is a training philosophy. And I wonder when you apply a training philosophy to very diverse goals, is the same, does, the train, does the same training philosophy work regardless of if I'm targeting a 60-minute criterium, I want to be national criterium champion, or if I'm targeting a 350-kilometer ultra-endurance race? Really what I'm getting at is how important is it to calibrate what we're optimizing for? Well, I, I would say it's really not a philosophy, but it's more of a self-organizing principle. That is that what are the constraints for us as, as athletes, we, if we want to be successful in our endurance endeavors, whether it's as a criterium racer or as a GC candidate or as an ultra uh, rider, we have to, uh, to define a sustainable way. I know that's a tired word, but we have to have a, a methodology that, keep, that we stay healthy uh, d doing. Because if we're not staying healthy, if we're not recovering oh, on average from day to day, if we're not able to train for months and even years in this endeavor, then the, the methodology is not appropriate. And so the, I think that is what we've seen is that, well, I didn't invent polarized training, but what I saw is that athlete populations from, from the diverse sports that really weren't talking to each other or independent of each other, finding the same solution to a problem, to a biological challenge, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's very interesting. I had Dr. David Lippman on the podcast. You might have come across some of his work in the area of human physiology as well. And he advocated something very similar, and he had a nice phrase. He said, if you zoom out and look at an athlete's macro cycle, be it a training, annual training year or multi-training year, success outcomes are less defined by the athlete's ceiling and more defined by the athlete's floor. So how good is our worst week is much more important than how good is our best week. Yeah, and I've, I've in some presentations internationally, I've just had a PowerPoint slide with a number on it, like 532. And I said, okay, this is a pretty important number. What is it? They're like, uh, is it the watts for five minutes? Or that's is a big it watts. The, you know, I said, no. Yeah, that would be pretty darn good. <laughs> no, I said, no, that's the number of sessions that athlete successfully achieved in that year. Ooh. Let's say it was a triathlete. And, and, and my number might be 315. Uh, a, a cyclist might be 400. A, a triathlete might be 600 workouts. A, a hobby, a recreational cyclist, it might be 150. But depending on my goals, that's one of the success criteria is, am, am I able to be consistent? Have I been able to stay healthy, avoid injury, and string together a long sequence of workouts that were executed basically after my intention? And, and what we find is when athletes stand on the podium and you ask them, well, what's your secret? They'll say, well, the, my secret is I don't have a secret. My secret is that I get the work done. I, I was fortunate enough to have a six-month period where I, I was able to train very consistently without injury or illness, and good things happened for me. You know, that's the, often the story. That's kind of boring, but that's, that's the floor is, is being able to achieve that, I would say. I had a chat with a friend of mine actually in a sauna and he works in private equity recently and he's very interested in the health longevity fitness space a lot of their investments are starting to move into that space and he was asking me my opinions on it and i actually think that we kind of are in this pendulum effect we came out of the pandemic and there's so many products podcasters youtubers article saying, if you just do this one thing, here's the silver bullet for health. It's a ketone, it's an infrared sauna, it's a cold plunge. And this is because the general population are starting to become aware of health and are trying to optimize for health. But something that athletes know and have known for a long time is there is no one thing. There's 
that may be a, like ketones, there might be research to show they're super helpful at preserving glycogen levels late in a race. But the unglamorous reality of high performance, it's the compounding effect of hundreds and thousands of good decisions over the courses of weeks, months, and years. Yeah, I mean, I was just listening, you know, I've kept up a bit with uh, some of the low carbohydrate versus fat issues, you know, and and there's been a lot of athletes that have tried to do low fat or low carb diets, you know, high, high fat, low carb diets and really injured, hurt themselves, you know, because they added a stress to their own body. But there's, there's just so many of these different fads and different ideas that have been propagated. But what we see consistently is, look, our evolution says we need certain things. We need activity. We need sleep. We need recovery and we need fueling. And, 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 and getting the basics right solves so many problems. Uh, I can exemplify this. Uh, I heard a podcast from or a big interview from Gustav Eid and, and Christian Blomenfeld. I've had their coach on the podcast the a few weeks ago, actually. Yeah, world-class cyclists. Well, their original coaches from this town, the one that discovered them as teenagers and brought them up to a world-class level, um, and, and, but those two guys said, look, we don't use any of these recovery modalities. The only one we use is sleep. And they said that we found out that if we avoid, if we don't do the massage and if we don't do the whatever, the cold plunge and that, we have more time to sleep. And sleep is our, is our weapon, you know, our recovery weapon. And that, that's just about as, as old school as you can get. But that's, that's physiology. That's the human biology is, is, you know, if we go back a thousand years, we didn't have massage pistols and cold plunges and that, but sleep has been there. How important is it? You mentioned Matthew Vanderpool, Gustav Eden, some of the best athletes in the world. How important is it for amateurs that they experiment, that they push the boundaries? Is it important in the sense that at some point it'll be a trickle down effect and we can deconstruct their success to make ourselves faster as age groupers, as amateur tattoos, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I was, I've, I've talked about this issue several times and that is that, you know, there are, there's a reason that car companies have a formula one team. A lot of car companies invest millions in an F1 team, because that F1 team is expensive. Yeah, I can imagine. And, and so why do they do it? And it's not because they're altruistic. It's not because they think it's fun to entertain the viewers. They're doing it because it's a wonderful innovation arena. And they, they then, these innovations from the cars, like all the buttons on your, your modern car, the buttons that are on the steering wheel, where did that come from? It came from Formula One. It never would have happened from the iterative process of the family car but it happened because the Formula One cars, they had to get them narrower so that they had better aerodynamics and therefore they had to take away some things and they put those buttons and bells and whistles on the steering wheel. So that was, that was of necessity of op, to, to optimize. Well, those kinds of innovations happen in F1 all the time, the analog, anti-lock brakes, things like that, and they end up in a family car. Well, the, the athlete is the same. The athlete is trying to optimize everything and trying to figure out how do I make this sustainable because it's going to take me several years to reach peak performance. I've got to stay healthy. How do I do that? And that's what we want to do as regular folks as well. We want to have a, a lifestyle that is reasonably enjoyable and sustainable and at the same time achieve some goals, some fitness goals, whether it's based on training three days a week or based on training six days a week. You know, but we still are trying to find a rhythm in our training that allows us to function and to deal with all the other challenges of our lives, our, our children, our, our spouses, and so forth. So I think that actually we, we can learn a lot from the high-performance athletes because they're, they're having to optimize under very demanding constraints. That's kind of what we do, too, as amateurs. The trickle down has been interesting, even in terms of tech. I remember everyone uses a power meter now. If you go on your local group ride, I would say yeah. 90 plus percent of people have a power meter. When I was in university, I was digging deep into this, had very little money, but a lot of time. So I was trying to deconstruct high performance because, you know, I was trying to get there myself at some point. 
And I remember reading about pro riders using parameters and SRM was the only parameter on the market at the time. And I looked them up and I think it was 3,500 euro was a parameter then. And I was like, I need one of these considering I had basically no <laughs> income. So I went to the bank and I told the bank I needed a car to drive in and out to university. So I went into the bank, filed a loan application for a car, went off, spent the full three and a half thousand euro on a power meter. And the looks I was getting from people were like, is that a Game Boy on the front of your computer? It, it was like I was an alien had <laughs> landed into the bunch. Because if you remember the power control four, I think it was SRM at that point. It was quite a clunky unit on the top of your bike. But that evolution or trickle down has been really interesting to watch. I don't think newer riders appreciate how expensive they were only a decade ago. No, no, no. Today's show sponsor is Pillar. Well, we're all familiar with the importance of electrolytes and carbohydrates and their role in our race preparation. Pillar is taking a completely different route. It focuses on micronutrition ensuring we're ready to perform even before we hit the start line. It's all about promoting a good night's sleep, facilitating effective recovery and replenishing those crucial micronutrients so you can perform at your very, very best. I've been running my own personal little experiment over the past month and I've been incorporating Pillar's triple magnesium supplement into my evening routine. I take it about 30 minutes before bed and the results I've seen are absolutely remarkable. The improvement in sleep quality, about 10% I've seen. I've been tracking my sleep with my Whoop device and the results are there in absolute black and white. I've given this to friends, they've tested it and they've all experienced the same results. I wake up feeling refreshed, having had a deep restart of sleep, so I'm ready to attack work, training, and life the next day. But don't just take my word for it. The data from your fitness tracker will tell you the story. So if you're ready to elevate your performance and your sleep quality like me, just go ahead and give Pillar a try. Head to pillarperformance.shop and use the code ROADMAN on your local website for 15% off your first order. If you're watching this in the US, head over to thefeed.com forward slash pillar and use the code ROADMAN for 15% off that first order as well. Now let's get back to the show. And now when I work with, I've worked with some tech companies uh, around some new measurements that we want to move into the field. And, and I basically said, look, if it's not on their head unit, if they can't see the data on their heads up display, you know, the Garmin head unit or whatever it might be, I said, it's not going to, they're never going to use it. You cannot be independent of that. It has to be consolidated, integrated into that because it's been, it's become just so basic and fundamental to their, you know, to their cycling workouts. I, I think it was a mistake Super so, Sapiens so, made. And I just got the email from Super Sapiens yesterday to say, they're, regrettably, they're, they're gone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If yeah, I think that's right. That's an example. Uh, I know Phil contacted me, and, and and I was really surprised because he was so full of enthusiasm on the next venture. Uh, yeah, because the, I guess the one of the ventures that would we've often talked about is is continuous lactate measurement. Yeah, and so um, Super Sapiens, you know, the Abbott Laboratories had and have that technology kind of on the shelf right now which is continuous lactate measurement. So they were thinking about pulling it down and doing, beginning to, you know, study it and validate it and things like that. But apparently, <laughs> I'm not sure when that's going to happen. But that was something I was, you know, they contacted me about. So I was very interested in that. Let's hone in and talk about the amateur. I'll define him as a time-crunched athlete because I think most amateurs will identify with we've conflicting demands on our time. We don't get to get out of bed a just ride our bike for the day. And if we have the three levers which you can pull, intensity, duration, and frequency, what order should we be pulling these levers across the training week to build this training yeah. plan for athletes? I guess I'll just repeat my tip, my, the story that's become kind of typical. Is I say, look, if let's start with just somebody that's trying to go from basically not training to doing a sustainable session and they can maybe do a 40 K on the bike, you know, and, and, and feel good about it, or it could be a 10 K run. So I'm going to begin with frequency. I'm going to say, look, my first goal with you is to establish a habit. Uh, I may not say that to them directly, but I'm going to say, all right, for the next six weeks, all I care about is you get out the door 
a certain number of times a week. Now let's agree on how many that is. And they're going to say, well, given that I'm the coach of the football team and I've got this and this and this, let's go for three, uh, three days a week. I, I'm, I'm going to commit to that. Perfect. All right. So we're going to commit to that frequency. Uh, but now do it. Get out the door three times a week. It's gonna, you're going to get challenged by it because you've got other stuff going on. But make that a priority. And let's talk and keep, keep in touch. And so six weeks later, I, you know, we feed, get feedback for, and talk about it with each other. Say, yeah, I'm doing it. In fact, I'm not only doing it, but it's feeling like a habit and I'm missing it the one or two times I've, I haven't been able to, to get out the door. And I say, awesome. Now we got frequency going and we kind of got a habit going. We've got a, you know, it, 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 in the brain, exercise is a habit. So then I said, now let's, I said, what have you been doing? Because I haven't asked them that before. All right, I haven't, in, I haven't asked about how hard or how long. I said, all right, how long, you know, what, what's your typical workout? Ah, I'm getting out and I'm doing walk, run for 30 minutes, or I'm able to ride for a half an hour, maybe 40 minutes, but that's about it. And it's been quick. Okay, now I want you to try to at least one of those days to start with, let's stretch. It's still three days a week, but now we're going to start using duration, that second lever you talked about. Because duration is a powerful lever from a biological point of view. It really, there's a huge difference between 30 minutes and an hour and 90 minutes. It matters. So we can use that to our advantage. But, but that does add some time. So I say, all right, let's try to stretch one of those workouts. Now, if we're talking cycling, then we might try to stretch it to, say, a 90-minute ride over the next six weeks. Okay. That's doable. In running, we'd probably say 60 minutes as a, as a goal, you know, to initially. So now we're using that, and we're going to use another six weeks to slowly build that out. We're not going to do anything in a hurry because that's another thing that, that people do wrong is they, they get enthusiastic, but then they go out too hard and they, they, they get hurt. Yeah. Or they have a really bad experience where they realize, man, I'm not in shape. You know, no, you're not because you haven't been doing very much. So, but it gets better. So, so we give them some time. So now we're 12 weeks in. What's 12 weeks? That's, that's three months. And now we've got two levers working for us. And now after 12 weeks, now I'm going to introduce that magic buzzword intervals and intensity, but not before. And I think that's one of the most common mistakes that's made is that we flip that. Of those three levers, what is the order that we use? We go out hard, so we use the intensity lever almost from day one, and then and then we get hit in the face with it. So after those, after I've established some frequency and I've got them able to stretch and they're comfortable doing a ninety-minute ride at a very aerobic pace and being able to talk to their their friends, now I'm gonna say, you know what? There's, I know there's a hill on that favorite route you have. Let's let's introduce carefully some repeats up that hill, some interval training to try to push your heart rate up kind of maybe towards 90% and try to collect some minutes or accumulate some minutes doing that. So we're going to do it several times, but we're going to progress it carefully. Okay. So that's that third lever. So in my head, and that's exactly what we see with elite performers is what do they do? They're, they're very good on frequency. They're consistent. They're getting out the door. It's a lot it, every day. And then they are doing a lot of duration. I was just looking at some workouts from, you know, uh, world tour teams today and, you know, eight hour rides. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at their power files. This is part of their day. This is what they're doing in January and February, preparing for the tour, for the grand tours. I'm looking at grand tour candidates, you know, and they're doing the eight hour rides, but they're not going hard every day. In fact, if I look at an isolation at the power output for that eight hour ride, I say, well, you know what? I think I could do that, but not for eight hours. You, you with me? So if you take someone that so, has like so a- So they're using duration. Like someone that has a use case B, we'll call it. Somebody that actually kind of like myself. So I used to view performance and cycling through how good can I be at cycling, period. Everything else in my life came second to cycling. And now yeah. I have to view cycling through a new lens. I have to view cycling through how good can I be at cycling in this time-bound container? 
each week. So I have maybe 10 hours right. per week to ride my bike. Yeah. So my new yeah. challenge is how do I optimize that 10 hours? Right. And what I see more and more athletes doing is pulling the intensity lever over and over again to ramp TSS higher and higher in that 10 hour week. So they're saying to themselves, hey, I can achieve the same TSS in a 10 hour week with piles of intensity that I used to achieve in a 15 hour week with a lot less intensity. Talk to me about uh, what I'm assuming is a flawed logic in this thinking. Yeah, unfortunately it is a flawed logic and, and partly it's a little bit driven by some bad metrics. You know, TSS uh, developed by Training Peaks and, and all power to them. And, and I know Dirk Friel, a great guy, but it, 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 says, it stands for training stress score. Well, stress is not what's being measured at all. It's measuring load. It's just measuring a calibrated load. And so let's say you do a four-hour ride at some reasonable power output that's well below your first threshold, you know, uh, your first leg take third point. So it's doable. The first hour feels easy. But is the fourth hour in that ride, let's assume you're pretty serious and you do a four-hour ride on the weekend. Is the fourth hour at 210 watts or whatever you're holding, is that the same as the first hour? Does it feel the same? Is your heart rate the same? Is your perception of exertion the same? I'm pretty sure the answer is going to be no. Definitely unless you're a me. pretty, unless, yeah, it's definitely not for me, but if, you know, maybe for Walt van Aert it is, but it's not for most of us. So that means that the stress of doing, achieving those, that, that power for that first hour second hour, third hour, fourth hour, they're very different. Okay, that's But that's really not accounted for. So they, are, they've interpreted it as a linear relationship between effort yeah. and stress, and it's not. and it's totally wrong. No physiologist anywhere would ever agree that that's, that's how that works. So what they have is a load score, which is great. That's great. But then, then they need to, we need to say, well, yeah, but now what's the stress associated with achieving it? Because that's what we're trying to manage, Right. Because if it gets too stressful, if the interval session gets too hard, we dig too deep, then it's going to take even longer to recover from, which is going to impact our subsequent workout. Because I often so wonder that. So we're trying that. to manage it. Uh, sorry to cut across, Justin. I often wonder that. Because if I if you take that example, so that's I'm doing roughly, you know, if I'm training 390 to 400 watts for 20 minutes. So yep. I'm going out at a 210 to 220 watt endurance ride. Like you said, that number was pretty accurate. And in error one, I might have 110 to 115 beats for that power output. But in error four or error five, I have this cardiac drift where I'm maybe 130, yeah. 135 beats at the same power output. Yep. I often wondered, is heart rate TSS a better approximation of that effort than actual power TSS? Well, it would definitely be a more, it would be more consistent with the concept of stress, for sure. You know, so if, if you were going to try to really separate and say, here's what I do, that's just the external load, here's what it costs me to do, based on heart rate or lactate or, or perceived exertion. You can also use perceptual measurements, yeah. but that's that triangle that we often talk about in training monitoring is external load and then physiology and then some perception, some some you know, what's, how does it feel? And so that's what we're really interested in looking at is what's the relationship between how dig, how hard I'm having to dig physiologically and then what I'm actually doing, both during a workout, but then across days and weeks and months and so forth. So, so uh, that's, that's really what it comes down to. And then part of you optimizing for you is knowing when to, when to pull the plug on a workout, when to say, you know what? Four hours is enough today because I've had already, I've got 20 beats of heart rate drift. I'm feeling really empty. I can do another hour, but I'm basically just going to be surviving it. And I don't think the cost to benefit is going to be in my favor. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do we get a different physiological response? So obviously we're all familiar with zones. And then in each of those zones, we get an associated physiological adaptation. When we start having that cardiac yeah, drift. Well, well, I'm going to back, I'm going to, time out, time out, time out. <laughs> it's not that simple. 
that's that's one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they think, oh, I've got to be in zone three to get the zone three adaptations. I've got to be in zone one to get the zone one adaptations. Uh-uh. It's, there's a tremendous amount of overlap in, in the biological adapt, uh, signaling. And this is what we've learned from lots of research in the lab and that it's it's not so simple. And the, and the muscle fibers are not like calculating which zone you're in, right? They're pretty, they're just, they're, they don't really care about your training program to that extent. They, they're, they're responding to, you know, either I'm being asked to contract on this duty cycle or I'm not. And there are signals associated with that. So um, that let's take that five-hour workout where you've got a lot of cardiac drift. Essentially, you started in, in your green zone, but you may be, in essence, in a thre- at threshold level by the end of that workout, yeah. even though your power hasn't changed a, a watt. Does that make sense? And are you getting a threshold because, adaptation then? Well, what you are doing, why, why is heart rate going up? Why is it drifting, as we call it? Why is cardiac, cardiac drift happening? Even and let's let's make the assumption that you're you're very good at drinking. You're you're putting water on board. You're getting some carbs, so you're doing that part of, of your job of, of fueling and drinking appropriately. Let's assume the temperature is you know you're in the UK, so it's not super hot. So those things are okay, but yet you still show cardiac drift. Why? That's because. You are your brain is having to recruit more muscle because you're starting to fatigue. Our our muscles are kind of organized in so-called units. It's like little brigades of fibers, and they can be recruited as some fatigue. The brain calls in reinforcements. Okay. So it is costing your body more and more to achieve a given power due to various fatigue and damage processes in the body. So the brain is is bringing in those reinforcements, and then it's in parallel turning up heart rate. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that cardiac drift is kind of an indicator of the reality that it's you're not in a steady state. There's no such thing as a steady state in the human body. If you go long enough, you wear out, you fatigue. And so your four-hour, five-hour ride is an example where, yeah, it feels great the first two hours, but it it does start to get, start feeling. It's a different kind of fatigue than that interval session. It's a, it's an empty, you're you're going empty. Whereas in that interval session, you feel like you're filling up with poison, right? You know, it's a, it's a different perceptual feeling, Uh, but they're both associated with the fact that you are fatiguing and you are calling in every reinforcement you can to try to mobilize and achieve the power that's expected. How do we measure the cost of that effort? So if the effort is the watts that we're putting out, heart rate maybe is an approximation of the cost of the effort. Is there a more effective way to measure the cost of that effort? Excuse the short interruption. As you can see from the background, I'm over in beautiful, sunny Girona, but this isn't my reality. Normally, I'm time crunched in Dublin, need to make the most of every single error. That's why I heavily rely on my Watt bike. I love it and I recommend it to you because it just works. There's no 10 minute setup, no unfolding legs, banging my shins off stuff, or wrestling to take a back greasy wheel off. Just jump on and it works. It's also compatible with all the major e-gaming platforms, connects instantly. If you're looking for an indoor trainer, I couldn't recommend it any higher. It's the last indoor trainer you're ever going to need. Head on over to whatbike.com and use the code ROADMAN10. That's ROADMAN10. T-E-N, and that's going to knock you 10% off your what bike today. Well, it's a really interesting question. And one of the things that we've started doing, and it's it's still early days, but thanks to technology, we're starting to measure ventilation also out in the field. And it turns out that, and you know this from cycling, you can hear how hard someone's working just <laughs> listening to them breathe. Well, you know, right? if you're in the break, that's one of the you things you'll watch for. Like, I'll, I'll watch for if I'm in the break with someone, I'm like, okay, I, I want to figure out the best place to attack here. Obviously, you've your little tricks of, we reference like 90 degree turns, and if you can get somebody on the wrong side of someone else's wheel, you know, maybe you'll get a couple of bike yeah. lengths advantage. But you're also looking biomechanically, are they starting to recruit more from the hips and their shoulders are starting to wag? But breathing is yeah, another thing yeah. you'll kind of tune into and go, okay, 
He's breathing has yeah. changed. Patterns. Are they are they breathing out their ears? Yeah. You know, and, and if I'm breathing hard, I'm going to try to try to hide that, right? <laughs> because I don't want to <laughs> expose my weakness. So so breathing is a is a truth teller, and it turns out physiologically, it also really is because we've started to we've done quite a lot of field work to try to look at hard sessions where we're measuring both that heart rate drift, but we're also measuring the ventilation drift because the same thing we're seeing with breathing frequency is it goes up, but it goes up at a steeper rate. So it's even more sensitive to fatigue. And it's a really interesting thing because when, when, when those athletes are in that really high breath, breath frequency zone, they're cooked, even if heart rate's not that high. Heart rate may only be 85, 90% of max. And you say, oh, they should be able to do more. But their breathing is telling us that now they're cooked. They're, they're empty. And so, so that's, we, we're starting to get at it, is this idea of how do we measure that stress during the workout and maybe make informed decisions about how, how, how deep to dig. Is that, yeah, does that make yeah, sense? That's, that's brilliant. So to circle back to the, the 10 hour a week athlete, are, are you advocating, uh, you know, my understanding of polarized has been an 80, 20 distribution of easy to hard. Is that the sort of distribution we're looking at? It's a good starting point for sure. You know, I'm not going to argue and say that everybody's going to be exactly the same. You may have some people that recover better and, and, and also age comes into play. I think as we get older, recovery ability does tend to decline. So the, the athlete, the 25 year version of me that could handle two, you know, really tough sessions a week and just bury myself. Maybe now I really, I do well with just the one, uh, for example, at six, close to 60. So, so those kinds of issues, there's individualization issues, but that 80, 20, you know, at least two, three out of every four days on average, three out of every four days are going to be just basically aerobic days without a huge high intensity, that's a good starting point. And then you make fine adjustments as a function of your individual abilities, where you are in the season and so forth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do we have methods or tools for measuring progress if somebody is on a periodized training model? Like what's our, our signals of progress that we know we're responding to this or we know maybe we need to pull a little bit yeah. more at the intensity lever. Well, I think what we see with elite performers is like you were saying, it's the floor that's the most important. That first, uh, in, in physiology language, we call it the first lactate turn point where that, that first break point where power output, you're increasing that, increasing it and, and, and lactate is staying low, staying low, staying low. You're under control. It's easy. But then you get this little first first break. That, that point in elite performers is they are at really high power outputs. You know, they're at really high relative capacity. It, it, it could easily be, well, in, in some of our elite riders, it may be 350 watts uh, at, at L, what we call LT1, you know, Tim DeClerc, who's who's the we call him the tractor beast. He can ride. He's yeah. he's ridden for five hours at three fifty. <laughs> I, I I talked to him last year. You know, we had an interview, and he says he had, had he did a breakaway in the Tour de France uh, this year, I believe, or was it the Tour de France, or was it another? But he got in a break, and he almost never is allowed to do that. But he said, yeah, I had a really good day. I was five hours at 350 watts. <laughs> so that, and that's just him. You know, he says, look, I don't have that upper end. That's, you know, that's why I do what I do. I'm the tractor, but my upper, my lower end is pretty darn good, you know. And that's, that's what we see with all these elite performers is their lower end kind of er, first threshold is high, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and in, enviably high, uh, and then they take it from there upwards. You're looking for improvements in that LT1, but if somebody is yeah. to, if we're to sound the warning signs on a training plan isn't working well, we're using a reverse periodized method, and maybe the distribution of the, the three levers we referenced, we haven't got this right. What's the warning signs look like that we maybe need to reevaluate our training plan? 
One of the, one of the, you know, there are several, of course, and we, one of the things you need to trust is if you don't feel like training, that's a problem. Cause if you're motivated and normally enjoy training, but your brain is saying, man, I, I just can't hardly get myself off the couch. Then that's, that is something you should be taking seriously as one of your first indicators. It's the canary in the, in the coal mine, as they used to say. Uh, but we also see if you need some hardcore physiology, we see often that heart rate is actually too low for a given power output. It's, it's suddenly, you know, it, it's 10 beats too low. And you think, well, that isn't that good. That means, you know, I've had a nice response. No, because it's not good if your max heart rate is also lower, yep. meaning you, you've got depression of the entire autonomic nervous system. The brakes are on. That is a very telltale sign that I'll, we'll listen to athletes and they'll say, you know, I can't get my heart rate up. You're speaking 100% to me Have here. you heard that? I just came back from, so I've been riding maybe 10, 12 hours a week for a few months, a winter break, and then came back a few months riding and, and some sporadic weeks where I traveled and I might only do two hours. And then I went to Girona last week for 10 days and the first seven days rode 28 hours and some of my friends are pro yeah. and done some rides with them. And the last couple of days, the last day in Girona in particular, 24 degrees, sunny, I could knock it off the couch. And when as soon as you said that there, I was thinking back to my previous rides and I was like, you know, 200 watts at 92 beats. And I'm like, oh, that's a very low heart rate for 200 watts for right. me. Right, yeah. But it is, it is very easy to misinterpret that because you, and then what do you do? You double down. You think, oh, I must be in really good shape. I got to go harder. So you, 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 unfortunately, you kind of double down on what's already a problem. So anytime, number one, if you're having trouble getting off the couch and you normally don't, then you got to take that seriously and listen to it. And then number two, now heart rate can be too high also on a given day, but the, the, often that'll be because of one acute you know, a heavy strength session or something. But when you're doing a volume overload, like you were referring to, the most likely side effect will be you, you depress the autonomic nervous system and the heart rate response, the brakes come on. And now you can't, you, you have that low heart rate at 200 watts, which looks seemingly good, but what's, what's hidden is, is that, hey, your max heart rate's also down. Your, everything is down. Yep. And you, you're, you're having trouble mobilizing. And so the only, what's the recipe for that? Rest. There is no magic. You have, you've gone too far. You're going to have to rein it back in and give yourself some, some rest or in easy days. What's the role of strength training for uh, amateur athletes? Is it essential? What's the role, the role of strength, strength, training? strength training? Yeah, should it be all year round incorporated? I think so, and for a, but for a number of different reasons that aren't all related to performance, because one of the things let's we got to be honest about cycling. It doesn't give us the bone loading that we should have. You know, our bones need to to have the normal loading. You know, a heavy gravitational load, some jumping, and that to to maintain healthy bone structure, so called bone density. And so one of the issues with cycling is we don't get much of that. We don't get any, to be honest. And we don't get eccentric loading. So cycling has some very specific mus muscular um, characteristics. We're only doing the contraction part. We're never doing the stretch under load. We're not doing the ballistic part. And those are, those are stresses and signals that our body needs. So part of the, the value of string training is just to keep you balanced as a as an athlete. Plus you're going to, you tend to get in these crunched over positions. I'm trying to show on the video that nobody's seen right now. Uh, so what do you do in the way round? Well, you want to counteract that with more extension movements. So, so from independent of performance, a couple of days a week in the weight room for 30, 45 minutes, kind of doing these types of movements is going to be good for the cyclist. And, and then if we're thinking about what's going on on the bike and getting power to the pedals, obviously that's an issue of, of connecting hip to knee to ankle, core stability, some, the issue of, you know, are you able to, um, you know, you're connected to the bike via your hands, via your kind of butt on the seat, and via your legs. 
are you able to connect all of those through your core? And so that's also an, a reason to be in the weight room is to have that, you know, connectedness and, and to strengthen your weak links, we might call it, which often for, for athletes will be core. I think there's a trade-off between performance and longevity. I think about the carbohydrate intake and you've some companies now like Morton who seem to be just cramming more and more bang into these gels and I've talked to World Tour riders on the podcast and they're experimenting with, you know, 120, 140, 160 grams of carbohydrates per hour, really yeah. training that gas. The number keeps going up. Unbelievable. Yeah. But I wonder about the effect of that on our gut microbiome and long-term health. And then more broadly, is what's good for high performance always aligned with what's good for longevity? Like this training week that we're advocating of reverse periodization and two times in the gym, does that performance align with recommendations for longevity or have we seen data on this? Well, uh, yeah, there's, we could talk about this question for two hours, but I, 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 I kind of adhere to this stress bucket model, uh, which is in the sense that our, our physiology, our n nervous system doesn't really distinguish between the stress of those training sessions we're talking about, the stress of the job and having a, a boss at the job that's a jerk, the stress of maybe a child that is sick at home, all of these things, they all go into one bucket from a stress standpoint, just stress reactions. And so um, I think we really do have to remember that what, what do elite athletes do? They tend to try to eliminate as many of those sources of stress as they can. You know, that's, that's kind of the training camp effect. You take away, I don't have to go to the grocery store. I don't have to pay bills right now. I don't have to do these things. I don't have to think about a job because this is my job. So in many ways, their, their stress bucket has fewer sources pouring into it. That's what they've done. They've, they've optimized their life for performance and, but we're not in that situation. So we have to accept that reality and live, try to find balance in the choices that we have made. We happen to want to have children right now, and we happen to want to be part of a, a, a marriage, and we have a, a job where we're not in control of all the decisions that are made. So we have these different sources of stress, and we, in doing that triathlon or the criteriums that we do, can either tend to release stress and be a very positive thing in our life, or they can add to the bucket. They can make things worse because we're treating the cycling race or the, the criterion that we're training for as this all, all powerful goal that if we don't succeed at, we're a, we're a failure. That's going to, you know, that's not going to be a good recipe for sustainability. Does that make sense? Yeah, hundred percent. It's really interesting that for so long, I think we spoke to experts and they had an expertise that was siloed, but now we're starting to see it, it's also interconnected. Like I'm almost wondering, have you seen data on, is there a link between different types of training plans and happiness levels? <laughs> I think so. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, that's that one of the. I had a, a uh, interview with Tim DeClerc, the the tractor I was talking about, and and that's one of the things we were talking about. Is he says, look, I enjoy cycling with my butt with my team. We we laugh a lot. We enjoy it. He says that's part of what makes it motivating for us is that we enjoy the camaraderie. We're telling jokes. Er, he says every day cannot be just you know killing yourself. And, and we enjoy our coffee stop uh, three hours into the ride and we earn it, you know? And so, so he was talking about how they find joy in the daily grind. Yeah. And, and many athletes, you know, from, from uh, Kipchoga from the marathon talks about smiling at the end of a workout, Killian Jornet, the, the great ski, you know, ski mountaineering athlete, they talk about the joy that they experience in training. Well, that's a different attitude than thinking you're going to go out there and kill it every day and, and no pain, no gain. That's not what I'm hearing from the best athletes in the world. It's, 
interesting you say that because I had the converse of that. I remember having a coach and I, I was full-time at the time. So it, it might sound like a crazy session for anyone that's amateur, but it was a four-hour session on a Wednesday. And in the middle of this four-hour session, every Wednesday, I had 90 minutes at 330 to 340 watts. It was a sweet spot effort for me at the time. I absolutely hated this session. Like my feedback every week was, I don't give me this again. Like I hate it. Like it's disgusting. As soon as I get my training plan on a Sunday night, I'm already dreading Wednesday. And the mental load of this session surely yeah. far outweighed the physiological benefits I was getting for this session. But the coach at the time just kept going, no, you need to do it, you need to do it. And I eventually just parted with the coach. I was like, like you're not listening to my feedback on this. I'm actually like on a quit right. cycling or I'm gonna just sack you as a coach yeah. if we don't get rid of this session. But is there a way we can measure that psychological cost? Well, you know, we have, this is one of the challenging things. We have a lot of so-called psychometrics which are these various device, these various instruments, you know, they're, they're metrics instruments like uh, readiness to train, where you're asking an athlete some questions and they're, they're filling in a number on a scale. So we're trying to quantify something going on up in the head. We're trying to quantify that dread that you were feeling to do that, that session, right? And, and put a number to it. Well, that's, that's, never going to be a perfect solution because you're making assumptions about the mathematical nature of what's going on up in your brain and, and what's going on up in your brain is not linear. Uh, but there are tools, you know, we're at least trying to make sure the brain stays in the game and that a good, and a good coach, the, the, the best coach is what they would just say, well, how are you feeling? Well, and then you say, well, that workout is just kicking my butt psychologically and we're and doing it every week. I feel like I've just, I've stagnated. I think I need a different workout. I know I need the stimuli, but I need to mix it up. What do you think about that coach? And then the coach says, man, great idea. You know, you're right. It, it, this has gotten a little too monotone. I've gotten a little lazy here because I've been prescribing that same workout for you for the last eight weeks. That's That's not a good recipe for success because we know that, you tend to, we can tend to do something like that three or four weeks in a row, and then we stagnate, right? So he could have chosen to give you some more autonomy and said, look, I need you to accumulate 60 minutes of work at about that power output, but let's, let's talk about how to do it. We can mix it up, right? And, and so there are different ways of, of interacting between coach and athlete that would give you more autonomy as athlete in that prescription. Yeah. And that, that maybe would have helped you a lot. So say if I'm a self-coached athlete, I am doing a polarized training model. I have two hard training sessions per week. Given that you said stress is one bucket and our body doesn't differentiate between the conflict in work, marital difficulties and training stress, cortisol is cortisol what's the sign that I shouldn't do my prescribed session? Because the, I suppose, polarized training, it's great because it's 80% of the time is easy, but the 20% of the time that's hard, it actually, you have to be there. You have to show up. It has to be hard right, or else right. your training just falls into this gray zone all week. But are you looking at stuff yeah. like variations in heart rate variability or are you looking at subjective measures like, hey, I don't feel like doing this session today? Well, I think both are possible. Uh, you know, I have good colleagues that use heart rate variability, Marco Altini, who's developed devices for this. Uh, but even he would say that you shouldn't, you shouldn't let that be your only metric. Um, I really still do trust if I have developed good communication with the athlete, I, I worked a lot with my daughter as a runner and I know her language. When my daughter would say to me, Papa, I'm tired today. Maybe. I need a rest day. You know, she would say, maybe I need a rest day. I knew she desperately needed a rest day if she even asked the question. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, 100%. Because I knew her mentality was very high motivation, very high threshold. You know, she wants to work out. And so if that brain is now questioning even going out the door, I need to listen to it. So what she needed from me as her coach in that moment was just an agreement. Yeah. 
she needed a second opinion that consolidated what she was already feeling. And then, then she feels like, okay, I can take a rest day. And so if you feel as that motivated athlete you were and are, if you really are just in doubt, can I get on the bike today? Listen to that. Yeah. That's telling you something. And now if, if you were supposed to do a hard workout today, you were scheduled normally in that 80-20 model and you're getting good recovery, you should feel pretty motivated for those interval sessions, right? Because you've had enough recovery, you should feel like, all right, I'm ready to, I'm ready to go after this. So that if that's not there, then that's, that's at least the first warning sign. Now, when I've asked athletes about this and I, you know, I said, what is it that will, will tell you to, to pull the plug on a workout, to not do that scheduled hard session? And most of them said that they would generally go ahead and start the warm up for the session. Yeah. See how that goes. And then a lot of them would say, even, I'll go ahead, do the warm up, and I'll do the first work bout. And then if it's still just not there, I'll shut it down. Yeah. So that's kind of been the general what i'll hear from athletes yes yeah, sometimes i just know and i just don't even bother going out the door i'm going to push that workout out down the road a bit but often they'll go ahead and start the warm-up do a good warm-up and maybe even do the first bout of the plant let's say it was going to be four times eight minutes or whatever they'll do the first eight minute piece or bout and then feel see how it feels and if it feels just like shit then they say, okay, now I'm not doing this. For me, I know a key sign is if I push the workout later and later in the day, when I'm motivated, it's like out of bed, yeah. food, <laughs> boom. Yeah. It's like, ah, oh, maybe yeah. I'll do it at lunchtime. Oh, I'll, I'll do it this yeah. evening after yeah. I do a few bits. That's a key sign for me that, you know, I'm not fresh enough to do this workout. Right. And here's another thing about, because uh, we're, we're coming into this idea, of, well, all right, when do we do rest days? You know, because rest days are just kind of anathema for a lot of people. They say, well, that's just a sign of weakness, you know, <laughs> but it's not. And, and rest days are some of the most, are among the most powerful reset tools we have is to actually just rest that day, to not work out. This idea of recovery rides, I don't know where that even comes from, to be honest. There is no data to support that going out and riding for 90 minutes at 200 watts is better for your recovery than sitting on the sofa those same 90 minutes when you're really tired. You know, to push back I on that not, one, the, Steve, I, I think yeah. for some athletes, the idea of habit formation still isn't fully developed and a recovery ride, just the, the fact of finding your shoes, finding your kit and getting out the door is another vote in the type of person you are. It's a vote in that my identity is I'm a cyclist. I get up and I ride my bike. Yeah, yeah. I, I hear you. And I've been there. And, and like I say, it's it's very common for those of us who are in that, or are that type of person. We are people who like our routines. We, we're consistent. We're type, you know, we want to get things done. I've been there. You know, I've gone the 30 days in a row without a rest day and so forth. Um, but I guess what I'm saying is, is that I also am seeing that a lot of us in this modern, you know, in that work ethic, it goes too far. And we, we, we underestimate the value of a rest day and we overestimate the, the negative side effects. Yeah. We think, oh, if I'm not training, I'm already detraining. I mean, as soon as I don't show up that day, man, my body's just starting to fall apart. The mitochondria are just blowing up. No, they are not. That is, you know, <laughs> they just are not. That all the data demonstrates that that's just not true. The 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 mitochondria and capillaries and all that that you have built over months and years do not go away in a day, not even close. Uh, but what does go away sometimes is some of that autonomic nervous system stress and and some of that immune depression, immune system depression, some of these these systemic level things. One or two days of recovery can make a massive reset difference, really help get things back online, like that, that heart rate being too low, for example. That's the kind of thing that the way you fix that is to do that reset. I had Joe Friel on the podcast, and it was really interesting for me because Joe Friel's Training Bible book was the first book I ever got about cycling coaching when I was self-coached. So it was, you know, a bit of a 
you know, meeting John Bon Jovi moments for me chatting away to him. But one of the <laughs> one of the ideas he put forward, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is something he's tried on with athletes at the moment. So say he has an athlete and he says to them, they're going to have one rest day in a week. They're going to have two, you know, we'll call them uh, intensity sessions in the week and the rest are endurance sessions. And he says, okay, here's the seven workouts for the week, one day off, some easy days, some blah, blah, blah. Now you decide what order you want to do them in. So they self-select and they say, hey, you know what? I'm feeling pretty fresh today. I'm going to go and do that VO2 max session. Hey, you know what? I'm feeling pretty tired today. I'm going to take that rest day. And at the end of the week, he checks in and kind of says, okay, well, what order did you do them in and why? And he said he's been observing this over the course of months and he said he's he's really a, a big proponent of it now. Well, I think it's a great idea. I mean, I just think, because then you're giving the athletes some, again, some flexibility, some autonomy, in, in, and they're able to perceive how their own fatigue is happening. They know they're going to do a certain amount of work in that week. So I think that's, uh, I, I've basically done the same thing. The other thing I've done uh, and, and talked about with athletes is the, that I've said, look, there's nothing that says seven days is in stone, that seven days has to be the organizational unit for training, because that's what it typically yeah. is. Like you just said, here's the week. I've got to get these two hard workouts in. I need a co- uh, I need at least one string session. I'm going to have a rest day, you know? And so pretty soon you're like, man, I don't know if I can squeeze all this into these seven days. Right. Well, what I experienced that coaching my daughter and what we ended up doing was stretch, stretch and say, well, let's try 10 days. Yeah. Let's try a 10 day cycle. It ended up being nine uh, for her. And then she said, you know what? Now my training is flowing. That, that was the term she used because it gave her just a little more air in the program and, and room for, to really feel good about that rest day, but also enough getting enough of that low intensity volume she wanted. And so, and, and about, I've, I've asked over a thousand people on Twitter or a thousand responses on Twitter and, a, and a 10, 15% of those athletes said they were doing something other than a seven day cycle. So it's not as uncommon as you might think. Well, you know what? I, that's, I think a great place to finish up this conversation because that's what you've caused me to do all through this conversation is to question stuff that I knew for, you know, a quote unquote fact and that is, yeah. I use training peaks like a lot of people listening to this. And training peaks totals up your volume on a seven day row sure. total. So it's been so obvious to me that you should plan your training on a seven day, you know, period. But for no reason other than, well, training peaks just totals it up after seven days. I've never actually that's, questioned that's the, the fact that. Okay, maybe this actually right. should be a nine day period or a ten day period. Yeah. It's just like <laughs> Well, and, and if if you're a triathlete, I don't know how in the world you can organize your workouts in se- in a seven day cycle. Because you're trying to do swim, run, and bike. So I would immediately just start with a fourteen day cycle for them. You know, if that if I was a triathlon coach. It's not what you don't know that hurts you. It's what you know for sure that just isn't so. Well, but it's 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 not so. And I mean, I have no f- problem that Training Peaks chose a seven day cycle because it is kind of culturally determined, and not only culturally, but just facilities sometimes are open longer or on the weekends or not open. So I get that seven days tends to be a kind of a constraint, but it doesn't have to be. That's just the point. You can choose to organize around, you know, and 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 say, you know, it's just I'm I'm trying to squeeze too much in to these seven days. And seven's an odd number and 80, 20 is, you know, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work, you know. And so then you you can choose a different uh, math, a different uh, foundation or unit of time. So I just don't, I think maybe that is a good parting comment is just don't make too many assumptions that everything you have heard, read, seen is based on science or based on hard evidence. A lot of it is just tradition. Yeah. yeah. And so if it's not working for you as an individual, then don't be afraid to try something different. Stephen, I'd love this conversation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So if you like this video, you should definitely check out this video because I know you're going to love it. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel.